1 Kings 19. When Ahab told Jezebel what Elijah had done, that is, he had slaughtered the prophets of Baal, she sent this message to Elijah. You killed my prophets, and now I swear by the gods I'm going to kill you by this time tomorrow night. Well, Elijah fled for his life. He went to Beersheba. It's a city in Judah. And he hid there. As he went along into the wilderness, traveling all day, he sat down under a broom bush and prayed that he might die. I've had enough, he told the Lord. Take away my life. i got to die sometime. It might as well be now. He lay down, slept beneath the broom bush. As he was sleeping, an angel touched him and told him, Get up and eat. Well, he looked around and he saw some bread baking on hot stones and a jar of water, so he could eat and drink. Then he lay down again. The angel Lord came up again and touched him and said, Get up and eat some more. There's a long journey ahead of you. So he got up and he ate and he drank. And the food gave him enough strength to travel 40 days and 40 nights to Mount Horeb, the mountain of God, where Moses had received the Ten Commandments. He lived there in a cave. But the Lord said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I've worked very hard for the Lord God of the heavens, but the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you. They've torn down your altars, killed your prophets. I'm the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. Go out and stand before me on the mountain, the Lord told him. Well, as Elijah stood there, the Lord passed by, and a mighty windstorm hit the mountain. It was such a terrible blast that it tore rocks loose. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake, there was a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. After the fire, there was the sound of a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his scarf, and he went out and he stood at the entrance of the cave. And a voice said, Why are you here, Elijah? He replied, I've been working very hard for the Lord God of the armies of heaven, but the people have broken their covenant and tore down your altars. They've killed every one of your prophets except me. And now they're trying to kill me too. The Lord said, Go back to the desert road to Damascus, and when you arrive, anoint Hazael to be king of Syria, anoint Jehu to be king of Israel, anoint Elisha to replace you as a prophet. Anyone who escapes Hazael shall be killed by Jehu, and those who escape Jehu will be killed by Elisha. And incidentally, Elijah, there are 7,000 men in Israel who have never bowed to Baal nor kissed him. So Elijah went and did as the Lord instructed him to do. Now what we have here is a pity party that God attended. And what we learn from it, from this pity party, is that Elijah, one of the most well-known prophets among the Hebrew people and in Hebrew history, noted as the one to raised the first person from the dead recorded in scripture more healings more spectacular things more miracles than any prophet or person who had lived and in fact some people say he actually performed more miracles or god performed more miracles as a result of his prayers than all the others put together up to this point in the scripture well, what we find is that in his fear running from what he thought was imminent death he had been preaching to a people who had rejected God despite all the evidence that God was on their side and that God was pulling for them. And he let his apparent failure in that situation convince him of his own unworthiness. So he's out there and instead of saying, what can I do or what should I do? He's out there having a pity part and praying to die. Well, I just have to tell you, sometimes we need to thank God for unanswered prayers. I think there's a country song. If there's not, that would make a good title, Thank God for Unanswered Prayers. But what we learn is that when he gets alone with God in this context, that communion with God corrects this false attitude that he fear, has of fear. It's, and the devil will do anything he can to bring this false attitude of fear, to make us afraid of things that will never happen. Psychologists tell us 
that about 80% of the things that people are afraid of never happen in their life. What we see as our own failure, we need to understand this and get a grip on this, is not evidence that we're unworthy of God's call or unfit for His service. And we often think we're disqualified because we failed. But over and over and over again in the Word of God, we see people who fail miserably but still end up being used by God if they just surrender to what God's trying to do in their lives. Failure does not mean that God is finished with us. Oh, I'm sure you've heard the popular song these days, Fear is a Liar. If you haven't heard it, you need to tune into it by Zach Williams. When he told you you're not good enough, when he told you you're not right, when he told you you're not strong enough to put up a good fight, when he told you you're not worthy, when he told you you're not loved, when he told you you're not beautiful, you'll never be enough. Fear, he is a liar. He'll take your breath, he'll stop you in his steps. Fear, he is a liar. He will rob your rest, steal your happiness, cast your fear in the fire, friend, because fear, he is a liar. Beautiful words of a popular song these days. And they go right to the heart of the matter. The devil is a lion seeking whom he may devour. But Jesus said he is a liar, a father of all lies, and a liar from the beginning. So what do we learn from this mighty man of God who's having himself a little pity party? And by the way, I'm not being too hard on Elijah. We all have our little pity parties. Well, I have one. I'll just admit to it. I have one every now and then. Well, if I'm going to be honest, I have one more than every now and then. And I think we all do if we just be straightforward about it. What we have to understand as we read this segment of Scripture and what God shows us is that our spirit needs to be fed as well as the body. So he's out there moaning and groaning and complaining about all the things that are happening or not happening the way that he thinks they should happen. And God comes with an angel and provides for him water and food, but he's really in need of the presence of God. He needs something, and God leads Elijah into this wilderness to feed his soul and to nourish his body. So he's nourishing his body, but the most important part is God's going to feed his soul. He fed him there in the wilderness, fed him physically and spiritually. And the angels attended to him while he was there. So the angel prepares his food while he's holding a pity party. <laughs> I have to tell you, I'm glad that God comes to our pity parties. I, I don't particularly like pity parties. I don't particularly deal well with people that are always Charlie Brown and then nobody likes me, everybody hates me. I guess I'll just go eat worms. I just don't have a whole lot of stomach for that kind of thing. But I'm so glad that God attended this particular pity party. And you know what he did? He did so much different than me. He did it without rebuke. He did it without reproach. You don't see anywhere in here while this pity party is going on that God rebuked him or reproached him or chided him at all. On the opposite side of that, God is gentle and he's loving toward him. Loving by manifesting, preparing food for his flesh and for his spirit. His flesh needed to be restored after the conflict that he had gone through in the previous chapter and his spirit needed to be restored you know sometimes i think christians would be so much wiser and so much better off if they just understood that when they're involved in spiritual conflict it uses up our strength uses up our resources and our reserve and we need to get along with god again not only to restore the flesh you need a day off not just a day off of the flesh but a day off of the spirit where god can restore you where worship to get along with his word and feed off of him and off of his energy and let him re-energize you i guess you would ask this question while you're looking at this segment of scripture here's old elijah having had one of the greatest miracles of fire falling down and consuming the sacrifice that is recorded in the old testament and a lot of people if you ask them who elijah was they'll say well he's the guy that called down fire from heaven you ask yourself this question why is god so long-suffering with with this kind of attitude that Elijah had, why didn't God just strike him down and raise up somebody else? Well, the truth of the matter is, I'm thankful for this. 
kind of reminds me of me a little bit. God's not finished with Elijah. Uh, I went through open heart surgery in 2012. And I had to come to grips with reality that I'm here in this world because God wasn't finished with me yet. He allowed, God allowed Elijah time to recover. You know the word of God says that he's not willing that any should perish but that all should come to repentance. Now Elijah is feeling sorry for himself and that's a sin for somebody that's had so much miraculous thing, so many miraculous things happen in his life. God allows him time to recover. And I'm thankful God is not willing that any should perish. So Elijah heads to Mount Sinai where God spoke to Moses. If you understand what's going on here, he recognizes he needs to be at a place where he can meet with the Lord. Where's the most prominent meeting place in the Old Testament? Well, it's a place where Moses went, met with God, and received the Ten Commandments. So Elijah does what we did. He went to the meeting place. I want to ask you, do, do you have one of those places? Do, do you have such a place in your life where you can go get away? See, there had to be this isolation from the conflict and isolation from the distractions in order for him to get alone with God and listen to God and receive what God had to say to him. Because in order for him to be useful for God's purposes, he had to hear God speak. What you see is when he gets to this place, you look at verse 14, Elijah speaks freely. I'm making fun of Elijah when I'm reading this passage of Scripture because he's having this mealy mouth pity party. But he gets there and he speaks freely. He speaks his mind to God. He spills his guts, so to speak. And he tells God everything that's on his heart. It's not so uncommon, that is, his confession to the Lord that day. I've been working hard for you, Lord. I've been doing all the things you told me to do, Lord. I've been trying my best, Lord, to get these people that you've given to me, these obstinate, stubborn... And I, I know he didn't say that, but I'll say it because I'm reading through this Old Testament, and those people were obstinate and stubborn, and they kept going back and repeating the same things again over and over again. They were so much like me, I mean, so much like us that... It makes me sick to my stomach sometimes. And he tells God all about this. And then he adds this little ditty, I'm the only one left and they're going to kill me. Well, if you can understand what's really going on here, is Elijah is discouraged and he's thinking he's all alone in the things that he's done. And his aloneness is all in his mind. Because he has God's presence, he has God's spirit, he has these miraculous things that are happening in his life. And God shows him just how unreasonable the nature of fear is. Fear and unbelief are unreasonable if you recognize who God is, know who God is, and have a history with God. So rather than answer Elijah's prayer to die, God shows him that he is needed. He is needed in the world. He has a job for him to do. There's business of the kingdom that he needs to get busy with. And... Remember this, even if he was the only one left, let me put it another way, even if you were the only one left, and God says to him, he's not the only one left. He was one of 7,000. And in our great nation, in this world today, there are many, many believers everywhere. The devil tells you you're the only one doing the right thing. You're the only one teaching the truth. You're the only one going down this hard road. Oh, it's such a hard road because the Bible says wide is the gate, to the road that leads to destruction, and narrow is the gate. Few there be that find it. And we just feel so sorry for us, so we're the only ones. But listen, Elijah was one of 7,000. And you, friend, and I are one of many. If he was the only one, to get back to that point, he was needed just like light is needed in the darkness. He was needed just like salt is needed. Even a small dose, y'all, it makes food taste so much better. And when God's people are in the world and they're providing light and providing salt, then we're merely doing what God has called us to do. So what's God do? Instead of God judging him and being mean to him, and so often we're afraid to go to God and talk to him and really be honest about what we think and we feel, 
you know, it's okay sometimes to go to God and say, Lord, I don't understand what you're doing. I mean, I've actually gone to the Lord and said, I don't think you know what you're doing. And well, I get an education every time I talk to him that way. But I think as we see this passage of Scripture, God does what he does in our lives too. He gives him what he needs most. And it's not his daily bread. Oh, yeah, he provides for his daily bread. If only the people of our generation could understand we need more than daily bread. We need what he had. What Elijah has that day is an encounter with God. So what does an encounter with God look like, you say? Well, is that worship music? Is that some uh, dramatic supernatural demonstration of a gift of some sort in my life? You know, are, are we looking for dramatic demonstrations of some sort? You know what Charles Spurgeon says? He says, it's a fatal error to look for the displays of power of one sort or another because the noise of that display may hush the still small voice that you need to hear. There's another passage of Scripture where we're taught that it's not by might nor by power, but my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. And what Elijah has is an encounter with God, and that encounter is soft and gentle as a still, small voice of encouragement. You see, the presence of God changes Elijah's perspective. The presence of God changes our perspective. It takes our perspective off of ourself to God's purposes. So in those verses, after he is through with his complaining, God says, all right, get up. Essentially, wash your face. You've took a nap now. You've got your refreshment. You've got your little snack there, baby, Elijah. How about getting on with your business? And the presence of God changed Elijah's attitude. He is afraid of Jezebel no more. What changes him? The presence changed his attitude. So you say, Brother Lane, what's this really all about? We well, get to the point. Time's pressing here. Okay. Feeling sorry for yourself? You have something necessary in your life. There's something you need. Needed, needed. One encounter with God is needed as soon as possible. You feel in a Charlie Brown day? Needed one encounter with God as soon as possible. Feeling like you're the only one doing anything for the Lord? Needed one encounter with God as soon as possible. His presence, the still small voice, would change your attitude. Listen, friends, I've been kind of poking fun of Elijah, but I've learned this. A pity party's not such a bad thing if God shows up. See, right in the middle of Elijah's pity party, God showed up. Back to the passage of Scripture. It's interesting that he's hiding out and God comes and speaks to him and he tells him to go out and stand in front of the mountain and this mighty wind hits the mountain and tears the rocks loose and then the next thing you know there's an earthquake but the Lord's not in the wind and the Lord's not in the earthquake and then there's a huge fire and the Lord's not in the fire but he's in that still, small voice. Maybe it's time you had a pity party. And I don't mean that in a negative way. I don't mean to whine to the Lord. I mean you get alone with the Lord and say, Lord, I don't know what's going on here. Things are harder than I thought. Things aren't going the way that I believe. You see, Elijah got straightforward with God in a quiet place, and he invited the Lord, and the Lord showed up. Don't you think it's high time? You got along with the Lord and listen carefully. If you listen carefully, listen. I think I can hear him right now. How about you?